Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to see all of you again. Uh, this week is just a, a introduction to game development. Um, you know, Game Dev 101. We're going to talk kind of about what game development means and what the different parts of game development are to give you a, a bit of an idea of where you can be with game development. So first off, you know, what is a game developer, really? Um, you know, a lot of people, they come into their first thought is, oh, it's just a programmer. You know, there are programmers that are game developers, but that's not necessarily true. We have artists and musicians as well. That's another thing you often think about in games. You know, you need the visuals, you need the audio, otherwise the game won't work. But there's more than that, too. A lot of people don't think about the director and producer side of things. Just like with any movies or productions like that, you need people to manage teams as they get larger. Otherwise, you know, your scope is probably going to get really big and your project not going to get done on time. You know, yeah, all of these things, they're all game developers. And there's a lot more that isn't included here that are still game developers. Yep, anyone who works on a game in any capacity is a game developer. So we accept people from all of these disciplines at this club and hope we can help all of you. So to kind of break it down a little bit, we're going to go into some of the specific aspects of game development. Now, a big one is game design. Game design is obviously unique to games because it is how you actually go and design the game on paper without any of the the like, you know, mechanics or the art. If any any amount of planning or prep work that goes into making the game good is game design. So whether you're getting out a piece of paper and sketching out the level that you're going to build your game into, or you've got a spreadsheet open and you're crunching numbers for, you know, stat tables in an RPG, those are all parts of the design philosophy. So some of the sub-disciplines, you've got gameplay design, which focuses on how the game will feel for the player. You've got level and world design, which is, like I mentioned, kind of sketching out the layout of the world the player will be able to interact in. UI UX design, which is, uh, you know, user interface and user experience. UI is any, like, menus that you'll experience in the game. And user experience is focused on giving a, you know, positive path through UI and other parts of the game. It's got a lot of psychology involved in it as well. It's its own specific discipline and a lot of other ones. Whenever you're working on a game professionally or in a lot of classes, you'll have a design doc for the game, which is like a big blueprint for the game. It's got every single important piece of information about that game on there. You've got all of its components, all of its systems, and the designers are kind of the masters of that design doc. They will continue to update that doc as anything gets changed and make sure that that is always a good place for anybody to go and see what they need to do to make this game happen. Now. Programming. Um, I know we have a lot of programmers here. Um, we do tend to get a lot of programmers. This is the, you know, all the behind the scenes magic to make the game actually run with the computer. Um, there's a bunch of different sub disciplines. You've got gameplay programming where you're actually controlling like what the player's interactions with the game look like. So if you're on a, you know, a 3D platformer making the character run around and jump, that's all gameplay. You got engines and graphics programming where you're working on building the systems for the game to run on, like working on Unreal Engine. Um, you've got network programming where you're handling any multiplayer stuff. Um, there's a whole complicated set of operations that goes into network programming, so they are crucial to have in game development. Tools programming where you're making um, different tools for designers and artists to use to make their job easier so that they can put together other parts of the game and so many more. There are tons of disciplines of programming that you can find that are all involved in game development. You kind of will find programming in every single aspect of game development. And while not every game developer needs to be like a programmer or good at programming, Pretty much anybody who works on a game will at some point or another touch programming. You don't really have to make a ton of changes, but you'll getting a very basic idea of just the like very high level structure of programming will help you a lot regardless of where you are in games. All right. Jaden is here to talk about art because she actually does it. Uh, yeah. So I'm here in the club. I mainly do art 
for everybody. Um, even though I am computer science myself, my main thing is I love doing both 2D and 3D art. So I will be going over some more of the aspects of it, which is super important as that really is what is shown to the player. So having a defined aesthetics is really important, uh, especially when you're trying to determine the feel of the game. Um, understanding mechanics is really good, but also having a great art style and uh, cohesive theme is really important as well. So of course, 2D is more of the physical like drawing portion of it. Usually this is taken in the form of digital drawing, um, but the disciplines of it in terms of more job related uh, fun stuff is character artist, uh, environment art, concept art, and traditional animators. Um, if you need help with animation, let me know. It's, I love doing traditional animation, but um, it's one of the oldest professions that uh, we have in terms of art forms um, is doing art in a two dimension form. But um, yeah, a lot of my favorite games are 2D. So, um, But yeah, so uh, another part of art in terms of video game uh, coming up in a much larger uh, capacity is definitely the 3D art form, which is digital modeling, texturing, uh, more shaders are involved. But yeah, um, so this is made, we usually use Blender here, but um, with some of the tools used in more um, professional contexts is Maya as well as 3ds Max. Um, so these will basically be a 3D form of geometry that the computer can render uh, each of the faces as well as their textures whenever um, the camera is faced on them in the game. Um, so some of the subdisciplines of it is um, hard surface modeling. So that is going to be just some basic like modeling components as well as um, getting your ground and landscaping in and your basic uh, models for the game. You have uh, sculpting, which is shown in terms of the Davy Jones area there. Um, so sculpting is actually really interesting because it can go from, um, they basically take this sculpt and usually ZBrush, and then you can low poly it. And um, what you see as the Davy Jones is actually, it wouldn't be all those polygons. It would be transformed into a normal map and um, put onto a more simpler mesh so that it would render a lot faster. Um, texturing, which is again, one of my favorite parts. Uh, I love texturing. It's about hand painting or procedurally creating a texture such as wood on you know, wooden beam or anything like that. It's really important to providing dimension to a 3D model, but also giving it an art style. Um, Animation is also really important. That's your rigging, that's your uh, keyframing, that's really everything. Uh, if your player doesn't really move correctly, players will notice. Um, but yeah, so it has taken a much of a rise recently. Um, I personally worked on MetaHuman today, which was really fun because it looks really cool. But it's taken a rise in gaming itself and how uh, people play it. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. But yeah. Uh, another thing is technical art, which is a perfect meld of programming and art. Um, so if you're interested in that, usually it works on the pipeline, tool development, um, sh shaders, um, rigging is usually done by a technical artist, um, as well as anything that is art related, but the artists themselves don't have the technical capacity to do is usually done by a technical artist. Um, and this is usually going in through visual blueprinting or just coding it yourself. Um, and it's really niche position and I personally recommend it. It's very fun to work with both, both disciplines and have um, perfect mesh. Um, but yeah, all righty. Audio is kind of the other half of the uh, audio visual in, in video game. Uh, it's not necessarily as as necessary for a video game to function as the video aspect of it, but it is it is definitely something that is very important for kind of creating the the feel and identity of a specific game. So basically, all sound stuff is divided into two halves: the music or the score of the game, and then the sound effects, fully kind of side of the game. Uh, and you can kind of look at it through. Um, through, through like separating both those two things. But um, one of the things that you kind of do as uh, as like an audio programmer for, for being on certain projects is kind of making those two mix together. Like if you want uh, like sound effects to play and be heard, you want to make sure that they don't 
interfere with the music too much. And if they do kind of interfere with the music too much, like they kind of are fuzzy, you might want to duck down the music to make sure that you can hear the sound effects um, when certain things like that happen. And that's, there's a kind of a lot of like, like Jane was saying about technical artists, there's a lot of kind of technical considerations about trying to create audio moments in games um, that uh, can, it, it's a lot of stuff to consider and can be something that you can seriously get good at and and have be like noticeable. Um, let's see. I'm not actually seeing this slide much. Yeah. So getting obviously writing music is is part of uh um like composing for score and trying to like make a, a game have a single like cohesive soundtrack, but like sound effects, either creating them or going and finding them and recording them, or going on to some of the marketplaces have like loads, loads of stock sound effects, trying to just, you know, if you get them all from different places, um, they're not going to all sound like they belong in the same game. So you have to do some processing work on that to make sure that they all fit into kind of like a single listener space. Yeah. Uh, the main thing to know um, is your scope for the project, um, making sure you know the deadlines as well. Um, you want to make sure you don't have too much of a um, scope because you, then the last week you see, find out, oh, you haven't done half your game and you have like a few days left. So, yeah. Um, sorry for being it. Um, so producers uh, mainly handle um, deadlines as well as um, team meetings, making sure that the project is staying on track to be done by the deadline. And directors are more on the creative aspect to make sure that the game is following the vision. Um, and they communicate with all the different um, teams uh, to make sure that the game is cohesive. Yeah, so those are, those are we've spent a little more time on some of the bigger aspects of game development, you know, being design, programming, art, music, production. There are other important aspects that we didn't go into as much there um, because we don't really do as much of them in this club. That being uh, quality assurance, QA, that's game testers. So the people who go through and, you know, run through the game a million times trying to find different bugs so they can report them to be fixed, that's QA. Uh, media and marketing, you know, that's how you get your game actually sold. If you make a great game, but nobody knows it exists, you're not going to make any money. Uh, you've got legal, which if you've paid attention to anything related to video games in the news, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of legal battles that go on for various reasons. So there is a lot of, uh, very large and expensive legal teams on a lot of larger games. Um, and not just for lawsuits, but also just for like general contracts for game development. Those are also important for a lot of larger companies. Um, there's there going to be research teams for games a lot who are identifying new technologies, new um, techniques that you can use to make games more efficiently and make your end products better. There are a lot of different disciplines that you might not think of as related to games, but they are there. So when it comes to actually developing games, um, for example, here is a ton of different positions. I know this is really small. You don't have to read all of them. Uh, this slide, this whole PowerPoint will be available to all of you guys afterwards. So if you want to just look through and say, oh, what are some of the, you know, customer service roles that be related to games or something like that? You can dig through this and just look for a bunch of specific roles. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of different sizes of game development teams. So the ones that we all think of and play a lot of the time, you know, like you got Fortnite, you've got, you know, the new Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom that just released. Those are AAA development teams. You have hundreds of people spending hundreds of hours working on these games. And as a result, with that many people working, it means your role will be very specific if you're working on that team. You'll have a person whose entire job is just to make the camera feel good in a game. That'll be their job. They'll be the they'll be like the, the visual camera programmer or something along those lines because it's such an important part of the game and they have such a huge team. They want to focus on just that. I know someone who worked on a game and their entire job was the photo mode. 
So, you know, a lot of new games, they have the photo mode. You can stop and take pictures. That was the only thing they worked on for that game for the entire time. And they were a full-time programmer on that game. Um, Because when you're on those really large teams, you end up getting kind of pigeonholed into one very specific area. So if your goal is to go to AAA development, you don't need to decide right away, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. But having an idea of what specific things you find fun and you start to get good at will help you in the long run. Now, if you're working on an indie project, you're probably more in the, you know, fives to tens of people. You know, you'll have like a 30, 40 person team if you're a, you're like a pretty big sized indie studio. Um, a lot of times they're lower in the initial budget they have to work with. Um, but obviously you can still make some great games with indie. Usually the scope has to be smaller, and as a result of less people, you'll have broader roles. So the example I like to give for this is Terraria. Um, great game, love that game. It was originally made by like five people. I'm pretty sure they had one audio guy, um, two artists, one programmer, and a marketer. And that was their entire team. I could be slightly wrong on that, but it's something close to that. So, you know, you don't have a programmer who's the, oh, I'm the, you know, the combat programmer versus the world programmer. No, he did everything. So while you probably won't end up in a situation where it's that broad very often, um, if you're in an indie team, be prepared to take on a bit of a wider breadth of roles like being a programmer and a designer um, because they just don't have the, the manpower to take on one task per person. And then lastly, you've got personal projects, game jams. You know, you have, you know, Terraria originally started off at that size. It ended up getting bigger, and now they had a full development team. But at the start, it was more of a personal project game jam. A lot of games that you know and have probably heard of and played started off this way. Like Hollow Knight was originally a, a game called Hungry Knight, which was made by three people. And it was really bad. But they really liked the design of the main character, and they decided they were going to make a game about it. And that became Hollow Knight. And now that's a huge game that people really love, because it's a great game. Um, but when you're on there, you're going to end up kind of doing a little bit of everything. Um, you know, even if you say, all right, I'm going to be the music guy, you're probably going to go in, like Camden mentioned, and be kind of messing with the, the engine a little bit to get the music to work better. Um, it's a lot harder to kind of sit back and just pass on your work when you're in a game jam because it's a very small scale with very few people. So you don't have a lot of different people to have your talents go around. As a result, it means you'll be you'll kind of learn a lot more about every different step of the process when you're working on a game like that. And it'll require a lot tighter teamwork with the few people that you're working on. That is the uh, type of teams that we go for whenever we do our game jams throughout the semester. And there are a couple of like roles that you can look at for games. Um, they don't need to be these exactly, but usually you'll have a lead, someone who kind of, you know, takes charge and guides how the project's going to look. You'll set up some programmers, set up some artists, you know, writers, audio designers, musicians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And depending on the size of it, like we mentioned, you might have a programmer artist or a musician designer. You just all of these end up being roles that need to be filled one way or another. So this is a pretty good guide of what things to look for while you're working on setting up a game team. Now, Nagula mentioned this briefly, but scope is a very important thing in games. The scope of a game uh, refers to the total amount of all tasks you're trying to complete to make the game work. If your game is, I want a person to be able to walk to the left and jump once, your scope is pretty small. If you want to make, you know, the, the next big open world RPG with a procedurally generated landscape and, you know, a thousand explorable planets or whatever, your scope's pretty large. Um... So it is very important to be realistic with the size of your team and the amount of resources you have when it comes to planning out a game. If you have five people in one week to do it, think really small. And if you hit that, you can always build on it a little more, but it's better to start small than it is to start too big. And often what we refer to as scope creep 
is what happens when you're just having fun on a game. Um, you you start you know you start spitballing. You go, oh, what if the guy that could jump once could actually glide too? Oh, and what if he when he was gliding, if he hit an enemy, he could now bounce and redo his jump? And you start throwing on idea after idea after idea, and before you know it, you've now made a game that's too big. So scope creep is going to be a very a very big thing to watch out for if you ever start working on a game project because it can end up giving you the um the silk song effect of we have not heard anything about that game in years and it's still coming out but who knows when any second any second now it'll be here for sure but so some little bits of advice to think about scope um there's a thing called a minimum viable product in a lot of different they talk about it in a lot of engineering or software development uh but it's a really big thing in games your minimum viable product is the smallest thing you would be happy with so if you cut out all of the the bells and whistles what is the least amount of work you could put in and be satisfied with it and that should always be your goal if you hit your minimum viable product, great. You have extra time. You can start adding on one thing at a time afterwards, but you always want to have a realistic minimum viable product so you have something you can hit and be proud of at the end of the project. You also want to kind of give a very strict time limit for the game and break it down into steps. So rather than saying, oh, we have four weeks, we're going to have a finished game by the end of the four weeks, Kind of breaking it down into sections might make it easier to get a realistic idea. So if you say, oh, you know, we're going to spend the first four days coming up with the design and then we're going to program for two weeks and then we're going to debug for a week and a half. So we have a final thing and the artists are going to work on the art for that week and a half and then they're going to polish all of it for the last week. Now you can get a more realistic, oh, we said we had four weeks, but we only actually have you know, like a week and a half to do programming. We need to scale this down a lot more. That's an important way to go about doing it. And then we have this this quote um, that we have from a previous VGDC member, which is very surprisingly realistic of when you want to figure out how much work you could do, think if you were being paid a full-time job, it was the only thing you had to do, how much could you get done in a week? That's probably a good goal for how much work you'll get done in the semester. Just because of school and because of, you know, other clubs and friends and everything, you'll find that this, a lot of times, game projects won't be your first priority. And that's perfectly all right. It just means that you need to be realistic about the amount of time you'll be able to put into the projects. It's always better to, you know, give yourself more time than you need and come out with something you can be proud of than trying to cram in too much time, making yourself miserable and not ending up with a finished product at all. So now Philip's going to come talk about some of the software and development tools that we use. Yeah, so we've talked about um, the ideas and the principles and the roles that we'll be doing in game development, but now we're going to touch on what you will actually use to do those things. So starting off is the game engine. This is simply a term for a program that is made to facilitate making games. Um, a lot of companies use their own custom ones, but uh, in terms of the ones that we recommend and that are available, Unity and Unreal and Godot are the main three we look at. They're well-documented, really popular, and um, pretty simple to use. Uh, going further down the list, um, Game Maker Studio is an option for 2D games. RPG Maker is pretty effective at making a specific type of game. Um, and uh, there are also some other ones that are available too. And this presentation, like Jack said, we will be sharing. And so this will be a good resource if you're like wanting to get your hands on some of these tools but not sure where to start. You can come in here and we've got links to all the different things we're talking about here. Um, yeah, so Unity versus Unreal is a popular debate. They're undoubtedly the two most popular game engines for individual users. Um, we've kind of outlined what we think some of the pros and cons are. Unity tends to be simpler for people to get into, at least for people who are familiar with programming. It uses C Sharp for scripting, which is a pretty simple language to get into if you've ever used an object-oriented language before. 
Um, it's great for 2D games. So you can see at the bottom, Cuphead and uh, Hollow Knight are both games that were made with Unity Engine and look pretty dang good. It has great performance and tools for virtual reality. So currently the most popular VR headset is still the Oculus Quest 2, which is basically an Android slap to your face. And so it's not that powerful and Unity tends to perform rather well on it, games made with Unity. Uh, there's a really big community for Unity. Um, and uh, because of that, it's really well documented, the things you can do with it. It's a lot less demanding on your computer, which is relevant to us because we are we are all probably using laptops. And uh, yeah, heavily used by indie developers, so on. Unreal has mad graphics. That's why a lot of game companies in the AAA space are using it. And for that reason, if you are interested in working in games, sometimes it's nice to understand an engine that's closer to what AAA game developers look for. Um, Blueprints is a system where programming can be made completely visual. So sometimes people who are not tech savvy or programming savvy do like Unreal because they don't actually have to write code like they do with Unity. Um, free monthly assets with Unreal, you get like $200 of assets every month that are pretty professional grade a lot of the time, which is which is crazy. And it's just generally more scalable for larger projects. It's also open source, so you can read through the source code if you want and understand a bit more the engine you're using. We have some games listed on each side of uh, that were made with each engine, just for reference. Um, for programming software and tools, Visual Studio and VS Code are your two biggest IDEs that you'll be using. Um, Writer is another one that's really good. We also have some extensions here that make the um, IntelliSense a bit better, especially with Unreal. IntelliSense with Unity is pretty good, which if you haven't, if you don't know what IntelliSense is, it's basically uh, makes suggestions and tells you things about your code while you're writing, which makes it a lot easier because you don't have to double check yourself as much. The IDE does it for you. Source control is absolutely what you should be using when you are working on a team with a game project. Some people are not familiar with it when they start out in games, but familiarizing yourself with the idea is definitely recommended because uh, swapping zip files of the project is a really inefficient way to work together. Um, GitHub, GitHub Desktop, and Git Bash, Git Kraken. GitHub is basically the website. It's where you're gonna put your repo. And then we have GitHub Desktop, Git Bash, and Git Kraken are all programs you can use to interact with your repo once you've set it up. Uh, Plastic SEM is something that was built into Unity. I'm not sure if it is in the current version, but some people have found success with that, so that's also linked here. Um, for 2D art software, uh, we have various levels of 2D art. Some people are more traditional, some people like pixel arts. So we kind of have listed here Krita and Photoshop. Photoshop is free as a student, so you can use that for uh, drawing if you want to. Pix Piscale and A Sprite and uh, MS Paint <laughs> are, are our uh, pixel art softwares. Um, there's no right or wrong software, especially with 2D art. Like whatever gets you to make the assets you want, uh, go for it. But these are all great options aside from maybe Microsoft Paint. What? <laughs> yeah, we'll add that to the PowerPoint later too. 3D modeling software, uh, there's a lot of options and fringe options out there, but the two biggest ones that are both really great is uh, Blender and Maya. We mainly use Blender within the club. Maya is on, if you really want to use Maya, it's on a lot of the school computers. So one's in DH Hill, one's in the VR studio, uh, have Maya on them if you really want to use it. But Blender is really lightweight, completely free, and it's really powerful. And it's it's gaining traction within industry. And it's probably a good thing to learn if you do want to do 3D modeling. Music and audio software, we have a few listed here. Some of these are for processing, some are for... Um, writing scores and uh audacity is more for the technical side of raw audio editing can I, can I add? yeah add some cameras so um, on this, the, the, the top one was paper and lms they're called DAWs, which is what you use it's mostly kind of the production side of music stuff 
Um, and so it's, I can definitely talk more about it later, but it's kind of like, there was one, let's say the few slides back, but it's, it's what you use to actually like kind of write and produce like music in, in industry um, versus MuseScore or Finale or any of those other notation softwares that kind of, as the picture shows, like prints, like music notes on a page. So if you're kind of more used to the, the, the score kind of view, maybe try MuseScore and if you want to like, See like the like piano roll kind of like timeline music going across the page is kind of like ominous. And yeah, and that's means just kind of for processing any sound effects or clipping music, uh, music MP3s that they do better, stuff like that. Uh, production software. So this is generally things you're going to want to use to keep track of tasks. This is especially relevant for longer term projects in game jams. You may or may not use them, but Trello, Mira, and Jira are all just great resources for getting your team to collaborate, keeping track of the task you need to get done. Because if you don't do that early in the game project, you, you lose time quickly and you will find that you won't have enough time to do things if you do not keep track of what needs to get done. Um, so we'll go over some general learning resources. A lot of people like to watch videos, especially because you can follow along and get a visual aspect when making games or following things. So for Unity Engine, uh, Code Monkey is a really popular YouTube channel. They do a lot of videos, um, just general guides to Unity and things about the engine. Um, Valim is a newer one that does specifically virtual reality tutorials, which are really cool. He recently did a, a series on making like a multiplayer online virtual reality game, which is you can follow along and make it yourself and, and add your own things. Uh, we also have some other uh, resources listed here, like Unreal Sensei, GD Quest for Unreal and Godot, respectively. We've got a few for Blender. Um, game Maker's Toolkit is a really entertaining game design channel that has a lot of really interesting videos about games that you've probably played. Um, and then we have a channel for 2D art. GameDev.tv is also a really good resource. It is paid, but they do sales a lot, and their tutorials are extremely thorough and give you a really solid understanding of the technical aspects of what you're doing. Um, and then these readings, we link to the documentation of each engine because that is the primary source of learning about what the engine is doing. And uh, forums as well are really useful because that's where people are going to be talking about or complaining about the engine. Um, the Unity Asset Store, as well as the Unreal Epic Games Store, have like a ton of game assets for you to use. And then on the art and animation side specifically, Mixamo is a great resource for finding character animations for 3D. Uh, Sketchfab, Open Game Art, and are both places where a lot of people upload really quality 3D models that you can use with your game. And uh, the Blender Docs are just the same thing as with the game engine's documentation for how to use that software. Um, so that is kind of the end of Game Dev 101. We are going to jump into showcasing, we've created a short 2D game Unity project that is a, it is meant to be something that you can download and use and build upon. So we, we have this built where it has all the components you need to design levels and add to it, and you can use it as a basis for a game jam or a way to use Unity. So we're going to open that up in just a minute and uh, just go over some of the basics. Next week, we will be doing a Unity workshop where we're going deeper into using the engine, but we will also be doing an activity during that where we will use this project and design our own levels, which can be pretty fun. So before next week, if you plan on attending that workshop, we say, we're saying that you should install Unity version listed above and um, go ahead and download the GitHub repo from that link. But yeah, um, before that, if y'all could please fill out this form, we are trying to gauge interest in what kinds of things people in this club want to see throughout the semester and also understand where you guys are coming from, what skill sets you have. So this will be really useful for us for improving our club and providing good resources for all of you, good workshops. Also, uh, we're going to show off the game up here, but also the link to play the game. We're going to put it in the Discord so that as we kind of show it off, if you guys want to try it, it's playable. This Our current version is playable in the browser. 
it's a pretty simple game, just kind of a little side scroller. You can run around and jump off of an enemy. Um, there's not a ton of complexity to the version of the game that exists now, but our goal is in future workshops, we're going to show you how to use it as a base to mess around and build on it. So once this is done here, we're going to go ahead and share that with you. So if you want to go ahead and try the game yourself and think about like, oh, I think I would like to add this to it. That's something that we can help you with at future workshops. Mm -hmm. And that's something we'll be briefly going over at the next workshop. So if you come there with ideas of things you'd like to see us do in Unity, that is primarily what we'll be doing. And also it is has all the simple platformer um, elements already done that are just drag and drop. So the idea is in the next workshop, you can use it as a way to have fun making a level, but also familiarize yourself with using Unity in general. Yeah, does anyone have any questions right now after the presentation about anything in general? Will it be put on the Discord? Yeah, it will be. Also, yeah, we are aware that for the first few of these uh, presentations, they are a little bit kind of just like talk at you. And, you know, we're sorry that it is more of just you sitting and listening to us talk at you. Um, but for these intro ones, that's kind of like, we just have to do it to get you familiar. Um, starting with next week's workshops, they're going to be a lot more interactive throughout. Um, so we've got, we're going to have, like we mentioned, the one workshop is going to be on um, basics of unity. And the other one, we're going to be in two rooms. The other one will be on uh, setting up, like, how to get started doing 2D art. So if you're interested in either one of those things, we'll have places where you can follow along and work on them yourself. And then, um, okay, we'll kind of end out with just giving you guys time to try it out yourself and mess around with it and see what you can make. Yeah. Um, well, we're there to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, every workshop from now on is going to be hands-on. There will be a hands-on aspect where you will gain experience during, during the workshop. Yeah, that also means... Um, like, if you are interested in doing the Unity workshop, but you don't have a laptop that you can use for it, reach out to us, and we'll try to find a way for you. We have a laptop that we can let people borrow, and we can have other ways to get you and uh, get you one of them. If you, you know, you're worried about you don't have a way to do 2D art stuff, reach out to us as well. We've got resources that we can help get you in touch with. Um, we want to make sure that nobody comes to the workshop and just has to sit there and not participate because that's not going to be fun for you. And we don't want that to happen. And it's also important specifically for the more game engine related workshops to come to the workshop with the game engine downloaded, which is why we're trying to say ahead of time that this is what we're using. Like 2022.3.8 Unity is what we'll be using. And if anyone has any trouble installing these tools, please let us know and we can help out with that. Yeah, it's not always the fastest install. So we have had the unfortunate, someone comes in to do the workshop and they start downloading it and we're like three quarters of the way through by the time they have it downloaded. And like, we, we try to, you know, just, you know, go talk to them individually and let and like give them the kind of one-on-ones -on so they can still learn it. But it's always just like really unfortunate when someone gets there and they're excited to try it out and they just kind of have to sit and wait the whole time. All right, so this is the example project that's available for y'all to download opened in the Unity editor. Um, I'll go ahead and click play just so y'all can see some of what the gameplay is. It's extremely basic. It does actually have music and audio, though I don't know if that's... There we go. Yay! Um, you can collect coins. There's a enemy that throws footballs at you. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh <laughs> yeah. all right you can't you can jump on his head and kill him um there's spike traps there is moving platforms and we'll try to get to the end on this one yeah don't die this time Come on. It's a very long moving platform. Um, <laughs> Alright. And you win. But the idea here is, and I'll show you, you can go and just create a completely empty scene. And this has absolutely nothing in it. If we press play, nothing's going to happen at all. 
No, there's no, not even a player. There's nothing. Um, and so what we've done is we've created this folder in the file structure that has everything in the game. So I can drag the camera in, and then I can drag the player. Uh, let me get the scene view open. I can drag the player right here. And uh, if I click play, I should just fall. Yeah. yeah We're just falling. Forever. Um, but then we could put ground under him. So we kind of made like a little bit of like a Mario Maker type thing. We can put like 20 enemies around him. The little guy. <laughs> um but yeah that's kind of the basic idea we can uh just put the flagpole right under him so he wins immediately that's true. yep you win <laughs> um so that's that's kind of what you can expect and next week we are going to use this to basically teach you what all these different parts of the Unity editor look like. And we're going to design levels as our in-person workshop. So that'll be fun. We can, uh, we'll be able to jump around, play each other's levels after we make them and uh, learn about how to use Unity anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the very brief, um, most of it's pretty obvious, but just in case, um, if you haven't really like seen it a lot, yeah, we'll save this scene. This is an important one. Um, for kind of like just how I'm not going to go into the process of actually putting them in, but as you saw, all of those, a lot of those different disciplines we talked about were directly implemented into this project. So obviously, right, he moves around and he runs and jumps. That was done through programming, the platform moving programming. All of that stuff was a programming assignment. Um, actually building out this level, if you are a designer or a level designer, kind of what we've talked about of, oh yeah, let me move this platform around a little bit. I don't want it to be right there. I want it to be higher up this time or something like that. That's all types of stuff that falls into the design of the game. Um, just kind of setting up where it works. That specifically is level design because you're designing the level, you know, but all of those types of things of making those decisions of how high do we want the guy to jump? How quick do we want the enemy to throw the football at you? All of those are design choices. Um, as you can see, we've got these lovely art assets here from, I believe uh, we had we had Carson, Jaden, Laney, and Thomas work on art assets for this game. Uh, four of our officers. So all of these all of these pieces were created by different officers. Um, and then you've got audio that you heard as well of the 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 little nice background music and the just the horrific scream when he dies um, is all audio that went into this game. And we, we tried to get portion of development that you might have to actually supplementing represented here. So 2D art animations, audio programming, all of that is part of this project that you can download and go look at. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one, one is our workshop is kind of Wrapping up a little bit, we're going to be uh, maybe playing around with this a little bit more. Uh, but one thing that we can do while y'all are still here is if y'all want to go ahead and install Unity for next week, uh, we can yeah. help out with that. That is, if you're doing the the Unity workshop, do you know what, um, are, do they need any downloads for the 2D art workshop? Do you know? Yeah, there's 2D art workshop. Yeah. So this slide is in the PowerPoint, which should be shared. It's got the info on what you need to download for Unity. And if you're going to do the art workshop, uh, Jaden just said pencil and paper. We'll put that on the slide. Yeah, um, you can go show it here. Yeah, so Frida and Clip Studio Paint um, are more traditional art. And then A Sprite and its free equivalent Libra Sprite are for uh, Sprite. And you could use them as paint if you wanted to. Also, if you do want to, either if, if things are just downloading and you're waiting, or if you get it figured out and you just want something to do, um, and you want to just play around with the, the actual game part of it, um, not the, like, Unity side of it, but just, like, actually try the game, the link is in the announcements in the Discord now. Um, again, like I mentioned, it's playable in-browser. You don't have to download anything. Just go into the page, and it should run the game. 
Uh, obviously, it's pretty simple. You've kind of seen most of what there is to it. But again, um, if you if you know either now or sometime before our next meeting, want to just mess around with it and come up with some ideas of things that you'd like to change, whether that's you're going to the art workshop and you want to think, hmm, I think it'd be really nice to have an art piece for this thing, whether that's I want to make the coins rotate and spin in the air. I want to make this like, you know, there's one type of tree. What if there was another? All of those types of things are good to think about for the art workshop. And anything like, oh, man, I wish that instead of just having a moving platform, you had the like the type of thing where it like spins around in a circle or you want to have a different way the enemies work. Stuff like that will be useful for the uh, Unity workshop for you to like mess around with. So feel free to try it. Ask us any questions you have, either for installs or about the games or anything else. And yeah.